Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Controlling Big Business, in which we will examine some of the ways this new middle class established its power over the giant businesses of the so-called robber barons, like the major industrialists shown here, and their less well-known counterparts. As McGurr notes in his fierce discontent, this middle class disliked the toxic individualism of plutocrats. They considered the rich to be frivolous and dangerous, and a high society dominated by new money made them feel justified. McGurr's story of the tone-deaf Bradley Martin party is one example of why they felt justified this middle class. The shameless chasing of British aristocrats by society daughters is another. The extravagance of the well-to-do in turning New York's Fifth Avenue into a mansion row and Newport, Rhode Island into an exclusive retreat are others. Thorsten Veblen, shown here, was a scholar who captured the problem in his examination of conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure. He said that the rich consumed in such a public way to demonstrate their wealth, and given the Calvinist worldview of many in the U.S., their natural superiority and value. Distaste over brutal industrial conflict often laid at the feet of capitalists as much as it was at the feet of workers and labor further inflamed this middle class. McGurr lists five mechanisms available to deal with this distaste. Laissez-faire was one of them. Let things sort themselves out. This was very much within the political tradition of the United States and it had great emotional appeal to the middle class. It accepted big business as an accomplished fact. Socialism, that is control of the economy by the state, was too working class and too European. Many in the middle class felt that it stymied individual initiative and reward for work ethos. But it also accepted big business. Compensation was another mechanism that McGurr said would be an alternative to dealing with these large corporations. Compensation required businesses to keep wealth in the community from which they acquired it, and the vehicle to accomplish this was taxes. This mechanism accepted the existence of big business as well. Now, there are two others, antitrust and regulation, that we want to look at very much more closely because they're the ones that this middle class and particularly the government run in large part by this middle class chose to follow. The first of these is antitrust. Antitrust is a regulation of competition rather than overseeing a particular industry. The middle class liked limits on business bigness. The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 is one of the most important acts in this line of antitrust. You see Senator John Sherman of Ohio shown here. He's the brother of William Tecumseh Sherman and a longtime uh, important politician in the Gilded Age United States. One of the most important cases that dealt with this Sherman Antitrust Act and limited its scope was the U.S. versus E.C. Knight Company of 1895. The Supreme Court in Knight separated manufacturing from commerce. We've discussed this before. It weakened antitrust activity by the federal government. Consequently, only 17 cases of antitrust were brought under Harrison, Cleveland, and McKinley, and most of those were against labor unions. Another case is the Northern Securities case that began in 1903 after Theodore Roosevelt created his antitrust division in the Justice Department. That antitrust division sued a company called Northern Securities in 1904. It was a $400 million holding company that had been founded in 1901 as a railway company to stop the fight between the Harriman Railway Lines and the Hill Railway Lines over the Great Northern Railroad. And it was engineered by Morgan. The decision in Northern Securities overturned Knight 
and revitalized the Sherman Antitrust Act. The most important of the Sherman Antitrust Act cases is Standard Oil versus the United States that was decided in 1911. The suit began under Theodore Roosevelt, in which Roosevelt's antitrust division in the Justice Department began chasing and finally sued Standard Oil. Standard Oil appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court called this case Standard Oil versus the United States. The decision in 1911 broke up Standard Oil into its components. One of the things that this antitrust ideology promoted ultimately, and these cases promoted ultimately, was the idea of the rule of reason. The Sherman Antitrust Act implied that unreasonable restraint of trade was to be done away with, so that when a trust formed and it restrained some trade, that might be okay, but it was not okay if the restraint of trade was unreasonable. This presumed that there were some reasonable trusts and monopolies, and this concept of the rule of reason was affirmed by these three cases that you see here, U.S. versus American Tobacco, decided in 1911, U.S. versus United Shoe Manufacturing Company in 1918, and U.S. versus U.S. Steel in 1920. Big itself wasn't bad, just bad practices were bad, is a way of summing up the so-called rule of reason. Now, the federal government acted to enforce anti-monopoly. In 1914, it created the Federal Trade Commission. There was a five-man board to hear complaints about restraint of trade. It had no enforcement power except publicity, and it acted outside of the Department of Justice. Then there was the Clayton Antitrust Act, introduced by Alabama Representative Henry Clayton, shown here, in 1914. This act, which ultimately passed, listed four illegal practices if they created a monopoly. Price discrimination, tying and exclusive deal contracts, corporate mergers, and interlocking directorates. This was much firmer than the Sherman Antitrust Act, and much more specific. It also indicated that labor and farm organizations were not themselves illegal, and so the antitrust acts could not be applied to them unless they met an even higher standard than corporations. Now, McGurn listed a fifth mechanism, and that is regulation. Regulation means the ongoing control of the scale and scope of big business. This created the federal government as a countervailing force against corporate gigantism. Federal laws were passed in the name of protecting Americans' health, welfare, and morals. Let's look at some of the transportation acts that were passed to regulate big business. The Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 created a commission to investigate mergers and, and other things. It was really aimed at railroads. It defined unfair business practices, that rates had to be reasonable and just, that rates had to be published. It outlawed secret rebates, and it outlawed price discrimination. The Hepburn Act of 1906 strengthened the Interstate Commerce Commission and provided in law some specificity that was lacking. It allowed the ICC to establish maximum rates for rail service. It brought other common carriers under the Interstate Commerce Commission control. In appealing suits, the burden of proof fell to the plaintiff, not the ICC. Some health acts include the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. This created the Food and Drug Administration and required inspection of food for human consumption. It disallowed interstate shipment of adulterated food. For example, strawberry jam made from apple scraps, glucose, coal tar dye, and timothy seeds was adulterated and so could not be shipped. 
it required a doctor's prescription for some drugs like cocaine toothache drops. And it required labeling for habit-forming drugs. The Meat Inspection Act, also of 1906, said that all meat carcasses were subject to a post-mortem inspection and that cleanliness standards were imposed on meat packers. There were also workplace welfare acts. The Federal Employers Liability Act of 1908 allowed railroad employees, which were the only ones under direct government supervision, to sue for injury and death based on a railroad's negligence. This is quite a step forward in protecting workplace welfare. The Adamson Act of 1916, introduced by a representative from Georgia, established the eight-hour day in railroad work. This was to avert injury brought on by tired workers, but it was also to help stop a potential 1916 railway strike. The Keating-Owen Act, also of 1916, allowed Congress to outlaw the sale in interstate commerce of goods made by children under 14 because Congress was unable to regulate hours and conditions of child labor. The Supreme Court declared the Keating-Owen Act unconstitutional in a case called Hammer v. Dagenhart in 1918. Regulation also included the money supply. Money was based solely on the amount of gold held by the United States Mint, actually Fort Knox, and it was really under the control of bankers like J.P. Morgan who could manipulate the currency by offering bonds based on it and, and other mechanisms that are a little difficult to understand, but basically the idea is that big banks could control the currency without any kind of public input. They were constrained and regulated under the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. This act was driven by the public's perception of a need for a central publicly owned bank to take the nation's money supply out of the hands of the private bankers. There were 12 regional banks established under the Federal Reserve Act. They had their own boundaries and their own boards and their own member banks. You didn't have to be a member of the Federal Reserve, but it was substantially easier to do interstate banking if you were a member of the Federal Reserve. There was control by a seven-member national board. Many of the seats on this board were still in the hands of private bankers. There would be a new single U.S. currency, ultimately called the Federal Reserve Note. Member banks set aside reserves of deposits at Federal Reserve banks. That is, a portion of the deposits that they were supposed to have had to actually be set aside and could not be loaned out or invested into the stock market. Quick loans were available to member banks, and that was the real thing that kept these banks as part of the Federal Reserve and keeps them as part of the Federal Reserve now. If a bank has a need for quick cash, like 12-hour cash or 24-hour cash, where do they go? Well, previously they had to go to other bankers, and sometimes big bankers, who sometimes wanted to buy their banks in exchange for preventing the bank from going bankrupt just because they were short of cash in a 12-hour period. And this allowed a different stream of revenue to go to these banks, and bankers tell us today that this kind of transacting is part of daily business, that banks need a sudden infusion of cash, and they just need a way to get some for an extremely short term. And this mechanism has actually worked out fairly well. Members also get to handle government transactions and take a piece of the fee out of it. So these two things, quick loans available to members and members getting a fee for handling government transactions, kept banks involved in the Federal Reserve. Morality was something else that the progressives wanted to regulate. 
One of the ways they regulated morality was, of course, through prohibition at the end of the period that we're looking at. But in 1910, these moral progressives of the middle class were able to pass the Man Act. Muckrakers had stirred up pu the public with stories of young girls being kidnapped off of streets by foreigners and forced to work as prostitutes. This was called white slavery. The Mann Act prohibited interstate transportation of women for, quote-unquote, immoral purposes. And that's pretty vague. It was enforced most notoriously against Jack Johnson. Johnson was a flamboyant heavyweight boxing champion who was African-American. But in reality, his problem was that he ended up marrying three different white women. He was prosecuted in 1912 and convicted in 1913 of violating the Mann Act by transporting the woman who became his second wife, who was accused of being a prostitute, across state lines, even though Johnson's actions occurred prior to the passage of the Mann Act. Let that stew for just a minute. In summary, this progressive middle class between 1890 and 1920 tried to rein in what it considered excessive, extravagant, toxic individualism of the upper class. One of the most important avenues of attack was to use the government as a quote-unquote countervailing force to keep the economic engine of the upper class, that is large corporations, in line. Of the five alternatives available, according to McGurr, Antitrust actions and ongoing regulations became the tools of choice. Both accepted the continuation of huge corporations in American society, but distinguished between reasonable and unreasonable business size and activities, what Theodore Roosevelt called good trusts and bad trusts. The federal government also responded to the scandalous stories dredged up by the muckrakers to legislate interstate morality in the name of protecting women from white slavery. The most notorious prosecution under the Mann Act in our period was against heavyweight boxing champion Jack Johnson, a flamboyant African American who drew the ire of the white and black middle class for his reported sexual antics and for marrying white women. Well, this ends the lecture, and as always, thank you for your attention.